All right, good evening or morning or afternoon or whenever you happen to be watching this. I'm so excited. It is the beginning of 2022, the first class of 2022, and what a perfect way to start it. We're going to start it talking about the life of Christ, and whoever made this schedule this year, I just, I applaud them for this because here we are right past Christmas. Uh, You know, we're celebrating the birth of Christ, and then here we are at the beginning of a new year, and we're going to talk about the life of Christ, and it's kind of... um, it's twofold. It's, 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 the birth of Christ was the ushering in of, of something entirely new. And I think the same way, every time I think about uh, the beginning of a year, the beginning of a new year, it's something brand new. It's like 365 opportunities in 2022. But when we think about the birth of Christ and the difference that made, that was definitely a dividing line for us as Christians, for the entire world. It was a, it was a dividing line for mankind of... Uh, this massive change. So there's no doubt that the life of Christ is one of the most impactful lives that has ever happened. And for us Christians, it is the most impactful life that ever touched this earth. But even if you look at the, the, hundred, the hundred most impactful lives in history from a secular point of view, Jesus is always in the top five. And, you know, for us thinking about Jesus in the top five, obviously we know he's uh, much higher than that. But even from a secular view, what Jesus Christ did, what he, what the impact he made on this world was monumental. But it only, it only elevates to the way we view Christ if you view him as the Son of God. Because even the secular people view him as one of the five greatest people that ever lived, the most impactful lives that ever was. But for us, knowing that he's the Son of God, knowing what his life meant, knowing why he was sent, what his purpose was here, how that affects us, how that changes our lives, the opportunity that his life brings us that we never had before he walked this earth, it just, it, it, it's just off the charts how important this life of Christ is. So uh, it's very fitting that we have a course immediately after Christmas uh, I hope you guys enjoyed your break. I remember when I was going to Bible college, I always looked forward to that break around Christmas because it feels like it's a little bit longer. Maybe you guys read a little bit. If you're, who's taking this class for credit? All right. There is a book. If you're, if you're taking this class for credit, there's a book you're required to read. We're going to talk about that in just a couple minutes here. Uh, but again, the life of Christ was such a, 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 such a change in, in everything for us. It changed the world. But it's a separation bet- between hopelessness and hopeful. Before Jesus Christ, there was no hope of salvation for us. There was no possible way for us to bridge that sin gap that was created with the life of Adam, but that we still continue to this day. We, none of us can live that perfect life. So we are separated from God. We lose the ability to be in the presence of God. God can't be in the presence of sin. So once we sin, once we commit that first sin in our life, We have created a chasm between us and between God that we don't have the ability, we don't have the ability to get across. And when when God saw that for mankind, he had such hopes for mankind. In the Garden of Eden, this was the epitome of creation. When God created everything in the world, he looked at man and he was like, This is the most incredible thing I have ever created. This is this is something that I'm gonna put my own spirit into. What a difference between us and the animals that when, when we were created, if you read the creation story of Adam, that God knelt down and God breathed life into him. So when we look at all the other animals, all, everything else that God created, he spoke it into existence. What, an, what a miraculous, how powerful our God is that he spoke mountains and oceans and all these animals into existence, spun the planets out just by speaking them. But for us, it was a, it was a personal connection. God breathed into us. He put a spirit into us that isn't present on any, other, on any other living thing on this planet. But God so loved us that he wasn't satisfied to leave us in a state that we would be forever separated from him. So it became necessary that he had to send his son. He had to come up with a way that he was able to bridge that gap that we couldn't bridge because our, his relationship with us was so important to him that he had to do something. So he sent Jesus Christ, and like I said, there's a separation between hopelessness and hopeful. It's a separation between what we couldn't do and what he could do. Again, we talked about our ability to reconnect with God. Every single person on this planet recognizes a need for God. 
And in the secular world that we live in, a lot of times we explain it as different things. We, we explain this, we have this spirituality that uh, it has infected our culture that we want to make sense of this spiritual yearning from inside of us. We're all born with that desire to reconnect with God, that desire to have that relationship restored because that's part of our original makeup. That's part of our original creation. God created us to have relationship with him. So when we don't have that, it's this yearning inside of us that we know something's missing and it's something that we so desperately want. But our culture comes up with all these different ways to explain that away, what that is and and how to fix that and how we see all these self-help things of how we can fix that for ourselves. We can satisfy that desire in us that we just can't, we can't, you know, and, and we see a lot of hopelessness in society as they try to fill that with all these other things, but it never quite gets there. You know, it, it can work for a while, we feel better for a while, but it's never long-lasting. It never satisfies that eternal yearning that we have inside our spirit, that spirit that God breathed into us. And then it's a separation between separation and relationship. That's exactly what we were just talking about. Our separation from God, our spirit recognizes that. And it's looking for that way to correct that. It's looking for that way to find its way back to God. And that way was created through the life of Jesus. We believe that. That's, that's kind of the, uh, that is the basis of our, of our Christian religion, is that we believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. We believe that he came to this earth. He was a virgin birth. He died on the cross. He was resurrected. We believe all that. It's the only way that we ever have to regain that connection with God. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, Christ before his earthly existence. So we're going to talk about what Christ was doing before he came to earth. And uh, we don't believe that Jesus came into existence on Christmas morning, obviously. Um, we're also going to look at the purposes of his life. We're going to look at lessons from his life. And we're going to look at what his life means to us in the end times, at times that are coming after his ascension, what he's doing right now today, and what he's going to be doing when the end of the world comes, when the end of this age comes and Christ returns. What's, what is Jesus Christ's role going to be at that time? So like I said, we don't believe that Jesus Christ came into existence on Christmas morning, obviously. Uh, but God, Jesus is part of a triune Godhead, a three-part Godhead. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to talk about what he's going to be doing in the future. Uh, if you have the syllabus, like I said, if you're... It, okay, so I know nobody here is taking this for credit necessarily. I am going to highly recommend that you look at the syllabus. There is a book on there. It's called Jesus the King, Understanding the Life and Death of the Son of God. It is a 300-page book. It is not... I'm not going to give you guys like a phone book to read, uh, but it's, it's 300 pages. It's well worth a read. I always try to sign books that I'm like, this is going to be good for your, in your library. This is something good that you're going to want to have on your shelf. It's $15. The book is $15. So um, I highly encourage you to get that. I, in the course overview, I kind of split up how we're going to do the classes, what's gonna, what we're going to talk about in each class, and um, that may vary a little bit. I also have my phone number. I also have my email address in there. If you want to contact me, if you have questions, I encourage you guys to contact me. All your professors try and put their contact information out there, but we really encourage you. If you have questions, if we say something up here that later in the week uh, it's just rattling around in your head and you want to talk about it, you got a question about it, I really encourage you to get in touch with me, and that's why I put my information out there. So... Um, it doesn't matter if you're not taking the class for credit, but if you are taking it for credit, uh, there'll be a test at the end. Um, you have to pay for the test, and you can take the test, and then you get credit for the course as you work towards your degree. Um, but yeah, so like I said, $15 for the paperback. So we're going to talk about Jesus before his time on earth. So we believe that, that all three members of the Trinity, all three parts of the Godhead, are without, bin, without beginning and they're without end. So there was no one that created God. And that's one of the arguments the atheists like to use is, well, who created God? How did God come into existence? We believe that there is no beginning to God and there is no end to God. He is an eternal being. And we believe that every person of the Godhead has, is the same way, that Jesus is without beginning, without end. The Holy Spirit is without beginning and without end. So, in the book of Jesus during the creation story, uh, God said, let us make human beings in our image. Let them be like us. So he's saying that in plural. He's referring to the Godhead as he's making that statement. 
there's always a version of each member of the Godhead. And the, 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 um, the concept here is called hypostasis. So H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. -S. And this is such a, a critical concept to grasp hold of when you're looking at the, 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 the people of the Godhead, the Trinity, the three parts of the Godhead. This hypostasis is a consistent underlying status of each one of the three. So we actually, what we believe, it's called, it's a, it's a tri-hypostasis that we believe in, that there's three individual parts of the Godhead, and each one of them exists totally autonomously, has their own purpose, has their own task that they're performing. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that, that his, his, uh, his, I don't want to say purpose, but what he's doing changes. And it's very dynamic. When we look at God, God is a much more, uh, much more stable character throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible, even into today, the personality of God stays pretty consistent. But as we look at Jesus Christ, before his time on earth, during his time on earth, and after his time on earth, his characteristics change. But the, the hypostasis is the, the basis. So hypo means under, stasis means, um, oh, I used to know this. Stasis is like a, a status of being. So the underlying status of being for Jesus Christ always remains the same. And in, in, when we look at in... The, they refer to him as the Word. So whenever you see the Word became flesh, you see that in John, that's referring to Jesus. But either the, either the name the Word or in Greek it's, it's logos, which means Word. But those are the two, that is the name for the hypostasis of Jesus, that character that throughout the, from the beginning of the time to the end of time, that eternal character, that is how he's usually referred to as, as the Word or as logos. But Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you see them change in their, in their role, in what they're doing, in what their purpose is, as you look at different times in history, or at different times throughout the Bible. But we're going to be looking specifically at Jesus in this class, of course. So uh, we're looking at the, um, the pre-incarnation. The pre-incarnation, what was Jesus doing before he came to earth. So incarnation is a, is a physical embodiment of a deity. Uh, so it's, the, it's, the, it's God coming to earth in a physical form. So we believe that Jesus Christ was 100% was God and he was also 100% man at the same time. We don't believe that, that in other religions, when they'll have a, a deity come to earth, a lot of times it'll be as almost like an apparition. It'll be like a ghost. You can't touch them. It's not a physical thing. You can see it, but you can't touch it. But that's where Jesus Christ was completely different. When he came to earth, he was in physical form. He was 100% man. Everything he did on this earth, he did as a person. He did just like you and I. He experienced this world just like we did. And that becomes... That becomes such an important part of the role he plays later on is that he experienced this earth the exact same way we did. Uh, we came into this earth and, and we make mistakes and we make errors and we sin and we miss that, that perfect bullseye that God created for us, God created for our lives. Each one of us has our own specific calling, but we miss that. And if we miss that at all, then we, we've missed the target. If we miss that at all, it's, that's again what creates that separation. It's us missing the target that God created for us. So Jesus came down, and when Jesus was here, he was able to fulfill his role here on earth perfectly. Absolutely, without fault, perfectly, he was able to walk through this life on earth. And that means so much to us because that's, why, that's part of the reason why he came is that he is going to be a role model for us. He is going to model how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to coexist with other people, how we're supposed to come up against people that, that are against us, how we are supposed to handle situations that aren't necessarily what we'd like them to be. And Jesus came down to provide that, that model of that. How do we walk that out? How do, we, how do we live this human life on this earth as broken as it is? And how do we do that in a way that brings honor to God? And that's something we see so clearly through the life of Jesus that in everything he did, he brought honor to his Father. He brought honor to Father God. It was, it was the main goal of his purpose. It was the main purpose that he was here is to bring honor to God, to bring us back into connection with God and to provide for us an example that we can follow as we live our earthly life. Because 
it's, it's almost not fair for, for, for God to have this as the standard. The standard is Jesus. The standard for us is Jesus, perfection. And it's unfair for that to be the standard if Jesus doesn't get to experience all the things that we experience. It's unfair for him to be the standard. So when he came to this earth and he experienced everything that we can experience, everything that we experience here on earth, Jesus got to experience. So that's why it makes it fair for him to be the standard because he did it. He did exactly what God is asking us to do. So we, we, we view it as an impossibility. Jesus Christ is the example that it is possible. But God still knew that we were going to fall short. And that's why it became necessary for the second purpose of Christ coming to earth. He came to pay for the sins that we committed. He came to pay for the price that we, the price that we could never pay. He came to pay on our behalf. Praise God that he did. Uh, I would hate to think if, if we had to fulfill the law, if, if that was possible for us to fulfill every single part of the law and that we could earn salvation that way, if we could earn it through works of obedience, if we could earn our way to heaven by following the law, we'd all be in trouble. If that was the only way that we could reconnect with God is by living that perfect life like Jesus did, we would all be in trouble. So praise God that he had the, the foresight, the foreknowledge of even you and I here today that he knew Aaron's not going to be perfect. Aaron's going to sin. Aaron's going to make mistakes. But I value him enough that I'm going to create a way that he can come back into relationship with me. Even if that means that I have to sacrifice my own son, I'm going to make a way. Such a powerful... It's, it's, it's hard to fathom that level of love. When I, think about, uh, when I think about somebody loving me enough to sacrifice his only son for me is mind-blowing. But that's the level of love that God had for us. That's what necessitated Christ coming to this earth. Everything he experienced here on earth, including up to his crucifixion, was for us. It was to pay our price, to pay, to pay our debt that we owed. We're going to talk about that more, I think, in session three. But I want to get back to, I want to get back to the pre-incarnation uh, pre Christ before he came to this earth, before he was born in Bethlehem. In the book of John, verse 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. So remember, we were talking about that hypostasis of Jesus Christ, and that was Him as the Word. Uh, that's, what we're, that's what He's talking about here in John. So He said, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. His light shines in the darkness, or the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So through Jesus, again, the hypostasis of Jesus, the Word, everything in creation was created through Him. And I think that is such a cool, a cool concept, a cool way to visualize Christ during creation. We think of, of God, uh, God speaking things into creation, but it was all done through Jesus. He was right there in, during creation. He was right there playing an active role in what God was doing. God was creating life through Jesus. The other thing that it said it was doing in this is he breathed life into it all. And we, when we go back to that creation and we talk about Adam having life breathed into him, that life that was breathed into him was through Christ. That life that was breathed into, um, that life that was breathed into Adam during creation was breathed into him by Christ. I, I, I think for so often when I was first hearing the story of creation, when I was a little child hearing about creation, I somehow missed all of this, that we look at it as it was God, it was God speaking all this stuff into existence, but all of this was done, all of this was done through Christ, with the Holy Spirit. All of that was here, all of that was here during the creation process. They all played a part in that. And we tend to want to separate those, but at the same time, it's always been the three working together. And throughout, throughout time, it has always been the three working together, fulfilling different parts. And even when Jesus Christ was here on earth, the three were all working in separate, in separate fashion to bring about the will of God, to bring about this plan and this purpose that he had for humanity. They all played a role in that the life of Christ, the Holy Spirit, when he came down in the day of Pentecost, all those things were happening simultaneously. And I think that just adds such a, 
the idea of the Trinity is such a hard concept to kind of wrap your head around because we don't really have anything we can compare that to. The way, the way that, that Godhead works. All three of them equal, all three of them equal part playing different roles. They are the same entity and three separate entities at the same time. But it's, it's a crucial part that we need, to, we need to understand their roles and how they work together. So I want to give you another, another thing that, that Jesus Christ was doing pre-incarnate. And that's found in Hebrews 1 verse 3. And this is such a good verse. Write this down if you're taking notes. Uh, Hebrews 1 3, we're just going to look at the beginning of that verse. It said, The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. And that word that I want to focus in on is sustains, that he sustains everything. And I think Colossians 1 17 says it a little bit better. It says, He existed before everything else, and he holds all of creation together. And I just think that is such a beautiful representation uh, of Christ. And it's, again, this is part of what, what, was, what is in his purpose as the word. This is part of something that existed before incarnation, during incarnation, after incarnation. He is holding things together. And one of the, there's a really great video out there, and some of you may have seen it. I'm sure you probably heard of Louis Giglio. And he does a great, um, a great video on laminin. And laminin is a, is a protein molecule. And if you've never seen his video, if you've never seen his talk about the protein molecule, molecule laminin, it's on YouTube. I really suggest you, you watch it. it I'll, I'd make it homework if I could. Um, but there's two different versions of it. There's like a 40-minute version, and then there's like a six-minute version. You can watch the six-minute version, and you're going get to the, get the understanding of what laminin is. But they looked at the human body, and they found a protein molecule that held cells together. Literally what it does is it holds, our, it holds our body together. It physically knits us together. And if you were to look at what laminin looks like, if you look at it underneath an electron microscope, it looks like a cross. I mean, it, it, is, it, is a, it looks exactly like a cross, not, not kind of like a cross. It looks exactly like a cross. So when we read these scripture uh, in Colossians, uh, Colossians says it so well, he holds all creation together. That includes us. Like Christ is holding us together. Christ is knitting us together. All of creation is held together by Christ from the very beginning. So especially when we talk about, when we talk about creation, we see Christ holding it all together. As God is creating, as God is creating this word, as God is creating all the animals, as God is creating us and putting all of this into this world that God loves so much, there's Jesus Christ in the middle of it all, holding it all together. And I think that is such a perfect representation of, of Christ still today, that he is what holds us together. There's so many times that, that I've needed something to hold me together. When hard things happen in our life, when, when tragedy strikes in our life, we need that, that, we need that something that holds us together that keeps us together. And that's literally one of Jesus Christ's jobs. It's literally one of the things he does that he was, that he's, his purpose, one of his purposes is to hold us together. And I think that it's just such a powerful, a powerful way to look at Christ. Um, and I think a lot of when we look at his life, it's pulling these, it's pulling these separate attributes out of the life that he lived, that he was here to be an example. He was here to show us purpose. He was here to teach us. He was here to educate us. Uh, they called him rabbi because he was a teacher. He had disciples. Disciples are students because he was a teacher. But as we look at his life, we see these different pieces at different points in time, just shining examples of what his purpose is, what he's doing. And we look at him here, we look at when he was here on earth, we look at him in creation, and I think this is such a cool thing that I never, I never thought about enough that Jesus Christ is what's holding us together. Jesus Christ is what keeps us together. And I think that's just, I think that's just so beautiful. So again, if you, haven't seen that, if you haven't seen that Louis Giglio video, I really recommend you watch it, or at least go on Google and uh, Google what laminin looks like so you can at least see the picture, the, the diagram uh, for laminin looks directly like a cross, but then when they look at the actual molecule and they, they put it under an electron microscope, 
it's just, it's a perfect cross. It's, it is the coolest thing. When I saw that, my mind was blown. Um, so in the next session, we're going to start talking about the prophecies. One of the really cool things about, about Christ is that he was prophesied before he came. Um, there's so many parts of Christ's life that just take it outside of the realm of, of human possibilities. We talked about how secular, the secular world views Christ as one of the five most influential people that had ever walked the earth. But what a, what a small part that is, what a small vis vision of Christ that is, because once you view him as the Son of God, once you view him as the one that breathed life into creation, once you view him as our salvation, once you, once you view him as the one that creates a way for us to get back to God and to restore our relationship, once you start viewing him this way, the impact of that life just expands exponentially. As we look at his life, as we look at the early parts of his life to the end of his life, through what he's going to be doing in the final days, when we look at what he did before he came to earth, all these things, when we put all this together, it, it, it just expands. It expands what he means to us. And I don't say that lightly because I think as, as Christians, as we, when we first become Christians, we have a, a tremendous view of Christ. But when you learn about what he, when you learn about his purposes, when you learn about what the Bible says about him, when you learn about what he was doing before and what he's doing later, I think his view just continues to grow. And we're supposed to examine his life. So much of the Bible is dedicated to the life of Christ because we're supposed to examine it. We're supposed to look at it. We're supposed to study it. And that's why I think this class is such a critical part of that is it, it starts you on a journey. This is something, like I said, it's exponential. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. You can never overstudy the life of Christ. You can never get to the point where you've, where you've studied all of it, where you understand his life perfectly and you don't need to study anymore. Uh, but I just want to whet your appetite through this class. I want you guys to see Jesus Christ in, in a bigger view than what you did before. That's my goal. And to have you see how these different parts, how these different aspects of his life, how they tie together and how they make sense when you tie them together. Um, so that is going to be the end of session one. We are going to take a break here and we're going to be back in just a few minutes for session two.